Well, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's business success series presented by Manulife. And today we're going to talk about Bill 27, the Working for Workers Act, what it means for your business. My name is Ian McLean, and I'm the President and CEO of the Greater Kitchener Waterloo Chamber of Commerce. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that we do live and work on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples as we seek a renewed relationship based on a foundation of mutual understanding and respect. As participants in today's virtual event, we are coming together as one. We believe everyone is free to be their true self and receive the same respect and opportunity regardless of age, ethnicity, gender, culture, identity, sexual orientation, beliefs, or language. We hope you will join us in fostering a positive environment here today that is a safe and welcoming space for all. We know that there is more that we can do, and we are committed to listening, learning, and growing as we go. Today's session would not be possible without the continued support of our sponsors and partners, and so a special thank you today to our title sponsor for the Business Success Series, Manulife, our platinum sponsor for the series, the Immigration Partnership of Waterloo Region. These organizations and many others are, are committed to supporting our local economy and providing businesses with the resources and tools they need to thrive. Just before the session starts, I'd like to go over a few quick reminders. Please ensure that your microphone is muted throughout the presentation so we can reduce any uh, background noise. If you have a tech-related question, please comment in the chat, chat section and a representative of our team will be back to you momentarily. If you have a question for either of today's speakers, we'll gather, I'll gather those throughout the session and try and have them answer as many of those questions as possible. All attendees will be sent a recording of today's presentation and it will also be made available on the Greater KW Chamber website. I now have the privilege of introducing today's guest, Nina Gupta. Nina's a good friend of ours at the Chamber and right across the community, and she's a partner in Gowling WLG's Waterloo Region and Toronto offices. Her practice focuses on a broad range of employment and human rights matters. She's known for her practical, cost-effective, and focused approach to employment law. Nina has uh, advised a broad range of employers from startups to world-renowned multinationals on all aspects of employment law, including employment offers and contracts, policies, compensation plans, cross-border employment, and regulatory compliance in Canada. And Nina regularly advises employers in compliance on uh, the Ontario Human Rights Code, the Canada Labour Code, and the Canadian Human Rights Act, amongst other things. Uh, Nina has been invited to present to the International Bar Association, the Human Resources Professionals Association of Ontario, the Law Society, the Advocates Society, the Ontario Bar, and the International Paralegal Management Association. She developed the employment law course in, at Seneca College and taught at both University of Toronto and Queen's Universities as an adjunct, adjunct professor. Uh, she served at five years on the governor, as a governor on the uh, Law Commission of Ontario, which focuses solely on law reform and is currently on the Rules Committee of the Ontario Superior Court, among other committees. Uh, in 2002, Nina was awarded the Queen Elizabeth II Golden Jubilee Medal in recognition of her service to the legal profession and the community at large. She's also been uh, received the Lexpert, Lexpert Zenith Award in 2017, and she received in 2018 the inaugural FEMPOWR Fem Award for Waterloo Region Law Association. So welcome, Nina. I'm also ple uh, pleased to join my good friend, I'll call him my old friend and colleague, Greg DeRocher. I'm going to try not to insult him because he is a really, truly a, a great community um, person, uh, been a great friend to me in my 11 years uh, at the Chamber. Um, and Greg is, as many of you will know, has extensive service not only uh, in business and at the Chamber, but th through his community. He served, uh, had a private sector company in the insurance business, chaired the business improvement area, um, in Cambridge, um, represented the Preston area of Cambridge as a city councillor for nine years, ran for mayor in 2000, uh, 2000. You think he's got the only record of, I lost by 39 votes in one of my elections, Greg lost by 26 votes. So we often talk about what could have been. But we're lucky that Greg uh, did lose that election because he's been the Chamber of Commerce president for that 21 years and been uh, a tremendous asset, not only to the region of Waterloo, but across Canada as an executive on the Association of Chamber of Commerce Executives, as well as the um, Canadian Chamber of Commerce Executives. 
Uh, it, Greg volunteers his time with several organizations, and when he's not at home uh, at a chamber event, or well, he'll find him at the cottage where he likes to find some golf as well. So welcome to you both. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Thank you both for taking time to join us today. Um, I guess one of the things that strikes me is that we're in the, in the middle of a, or I guess at, towards the end of the pandemic, what we, what we find ourselves is, start, yeah, fingers crossed, uh, we're at the end of, of this wave, but we're, we're coming towards starting to think about what comes next. This came up, Greg. Maybe I'll start with Greg, and then we'll go to Nina, because you and I got talking about this, Greg, when it was announced. And I think we were both a little befuddled um, as to why this was done in the first place. Um, so maybe I'll just leave it there. You take it away from there. It didn't strike me as being the top thing that you or I would have recommended to either get through the COVID and um, the last of the COVID wave or the top five for sure things that we would recommend to get business going again. Yeah. And I think, uh, Ian, you're, you're right. It's, um, uh, I think what we've learned over the last 22 months is, is governments aren't very predictable. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and certainly we know that, uh, they've been fumbling around and trying to find their niche of what they need to do to help people. And I think, you know, uh, you know, in all likelihood, it was the conservative government who maybe felt that, you know, workers, general laborers in the community were, you know, uh, fundamentally uh, missing out on some things and good for them. You know, there, if there are issues and the, the ESA should be a living document that we continually refer to and say, yeah, you know, this is not right. We need to make some amendments. But in the middle of a pandemic, it's almost hard to believe that all of a sudden you would come out with measures that on the surface seem to uh, impact businesses that are uh, really hanging on the edge of the cliff with their fingernails dragging along the dirt. And, uh, and, and it looks like it's, it, you know, it's trouble for them. But I, I, I think there's some good news with this, but we'll get into it. Nina's going to, she's brilliant. And she will absolutely uh, make you and I look really, really smart, Ian. There's no question about it. Well, we, as you know, as when we do the radio show every week, we remind ourselves that everyone that joins us makes us look smarter because that's not that's a pretty low bar for people to walk, walk over. But Nina actually will make us very smart. Mm -hmm. Listen, maybe the way to start this, and th this is feel, Greg, you feel this is more of a discussion as opposed to uh, like this is this is there's a lot of questions. I'm not sure there's necessarily definitive answers, but we should be identifying the issues that will arise for business. So we can take an advocate and say, even though you just passed this bill, here's the things you're going to need to change either in regulation or legislation so that it's not burdensome for business. But let's get started, Nina. Maybe um, Bill 27, the Working for Workers Act, give us a high level overview of what's in it. Like give us give us the, sure. the, the, the Coles Notes version. So the uh, one that's gotten a lot of press in, Greg, as you know, is the duty to disconnect or the right to disconnect policy. And we'll talk a little bit about it. The other one that's really interesting is the banning of non-competes and ordinary employee uh, letters. Uh, many of us know that judges don't like enforcing them anyway, but at least formally doing that. And there's some nuance I think that's lacking in the legislation that I think is worth discussing and perhaps the Chamber of Commerce going to bat and saying, look, yeah, yeah, kind of took a hammer to it, but there are some things that need to be fixed. Some of the things that got a little bit of attention was the right of um, gig workers like delivery drivers, Uber drivers, truck drivers to use washrooms. Uh, I hadn't realized how huge an issue that really was for that uh, sector of our workforce. So that's a that's a simple amendment, but it essentially, um, you know, kind of helps out people who are on the road for a long time and may not be able to get home to go to the washroom and don't have a home office. As a child of immigrants, I was pleased to see an effort to remove some barriers for internationally trained individuals mm. to get into the skilled um, skilled uh, trades. And, you know, you and I both know, and we've talked about this at other forums, there is a shortage of um, trained workers in Ontario. And uh, there are immigrants who have 
a really good background in it. And yet there seem to be insurmountable barriers to them getting into that trade. So I try to match that a little bit. One thing that didn't get as much coverage, Ian Greg, that I thought quite frankly would get more coverage um, is some of the reforms to the WSIB. They put a cap on premiums, which thank you, that's very useful for business. Um, also allowed some of the reserve fund to be distributed. Um, trying to streamline all of WSIB. I'm not a WSIB expert, but every time I touch it, I'm always worried that I've forgotten something because it's such a complex animal to deal with. So to me, those are the you know highlights. So some of the businesses here will benefit from um, the redistribution of the reserve to certain businesses and the fact that there's going to be a premium cap in certain you know, in in general. So that will be helpful. That didn't get as much media coverage because I think some of the other topics we were talking about had more human interest. You know, money doesn't have a lot of human interest, but you and I both know that without money, um, I don't know about you, but without money, nothing gets done around here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Listen, and that's good. I, I, you know, honestly, I had, uh, I worked at WSIB for seven years. And so, uh, uh, I remember when we started there, the unfunded liability was like thirteen billion dollars, which is why they're, which was unsustainable. Yeah. So they needed to have a plan. So it's very complex, but um, but that is that is one that will clearly have some effect on business. And I, I should rewind the tape. But after you give that overview, it starts to make sense why some of these things that you talked about, like the duty of gig workers, that's an increasing part of what we're doing. Um, the the uh, international trained professionals, Greg, that's something we've been working on, whether it's with doctors or engineers, you go down the list and then reforms the WSAB because that, because that is a huge expense for particularly if you're in, um, you know, construction, manufacturing, there are really high percentages that you pay as a, a percentage and Greg's from the insurance industry. I guess what really threw us was when they when it was first announced, the government itself wanted to highlight the duty to disconnect, which and Greg, maybe let's talk about that, because I, I, I think we should do that and then come back to some of these other meteor issues. That's a problem. The, the duty to disconnect. What does that practically mean? And I'm sure that's one of the areas that will need to be cleaned up because I don't think it's possible to effectively implement and, and I think what, you know, maybe I'd, I'd like Nina to kind of jump in on this and, and, and rationalize this, because I think we're going to find that employers that are under the benchmark of 25 employees, because that, that piece of the legislation is you have to have a, a policy for disconnecting your employees if you have over 25 employees. But you know what? I think what it's going to do is it's going to put downward pressure on those businesses that have less than 25, because you know, I quite frankly, I know my business. I know a lot of other small businesses. I, I think that lack of disconnect from the employees is, is probably broader in the smaller businesses than it is even in the larger businesses. So, mm-hmm. you know, I think what, what this is probably going to do is it's going to put pressure on all businesses to look at how they manage their workforce when their workforce isn't at the workplace. And that is going to be a tricky thing to navigate um, because a lot of small businesses aren't gonna understand that. And I think in order to be competitive in the 21st century looking for workers, uh, you're gonna have to offer the same things. It doesn't matter how big your company is. So. Nina, why don't maybe give us some impression on what you think is going to be the pressure that is going to be on all businesses? So I think all, uh, let me just tell you a little bit about how little this legislation does, but how ironically it's huge. So all the legislation really mandates is that a business with over 25 people needs to have a written policy with respect to the right to disconnect distribute it to its workforce, have it done before June 1st, you know, 2022, um, and make sure that it has a revision date on it. It doesn't give us any regulations. It doesn't give us, there's no, there's not even a helpful guide as to how to draft these policies. Now, luckily we can go over to Europe where they've had similar legislation and, you know, uh, you know, imitation is the most sincere form of flattery, as you know, Greg. (laughs) But 
why this is important is that we know that people are suffering from burnout and mental health issues. I mean, we were all, I don't know, but I have to be really honest. You know, this pandemic has been really hard. Uh, Ian, you know me a little bit more than Greg does, but I'm the classic extrovert. I love meeting people. I love used to going to the chamber offices and, you know, like networking and working a room. I'm totally guilty of all of those things and loved it. And of course, for two years, I haven't been doing it, right? So it's been really hard. And, um, and, and even for people who actually, and I have colleagues who are a little bit, well, almost everybody's more introverted than I am. So that's not too hard. <laughs> but, you know, who really actually quite enjoy working from home have found, you know, working from home, dealing with children, dealing with elder care responsibilities to be enormously difficult. You then have 24-7, 365 connectivity. And so what people are doing, because it's, you know, you know, you drive into your office and then you leave the office, it kind of forces a certain disconnect. We don't have that anymore. And what that is happening is that we're now working probably too much and not properly and we're burning out. So part of what the government is signaling to business is you've got to work on this issue. We're not going to tell you how to do it, but you've got to figure out how to do it. And it's not an easy issue, Griff, because... You know, some businesses, um, uh, you know, think about like a plumber or an electrician that is on emergency response. Well, I'm not going to wait until Monday morning at nine o'clock, right? Like, you know, well, (laughs) while my basement floods, I I need the plumber yesterday. Um, On the other hand, you know, can we create a culture where we have core hours, where we respect each other's core hours, where we move away from that expectation of an instant response to an email? Do we delay sending our uh, emails? Volkswagen in Germany has actually stopped. Their their server actually doesn't send emails to certain groups of employees between certain hours. Um, I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but can we create a cultural shift around, well, working too much and being available 24-7 is the hallmark of of a good worker. Because what really is, is a hallmark of a burnt out worker, right? And and I I guess that leads to maybe the next question. And I'll come back to you in a second, uh, Nina. But but Greg, I mean, you and I talk about this. I'm a night owl. And I I often, I've had to train my staff that says, at two in the morning when I'm reading a report, because that's when I, I actually do my, in the middle of the night, I'll say, oh, here's something I need. Um, I'm not expecting, uh, but, you know, I didn't, don't look at it. I see if my staff sort of sees it at five in the morning when they wake up, they're like, oh, my God, I'd better reply. And I'm like, I don't expect you to deal with this until you're in the office at nine o'clock. But it was on my plate. And, and, you know, Greg, we work odd hours Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of if you're in any kind of executive position, you would deal with after hour stuff. And this is one of the questions you've raised. So maybe you start there, then pass it to Nino in in terms of what does the legislation actually require? Because unless you have some core hours of which, by definition, you will absolutely have some uh, executives who don't fit into that category say, well, I go to dinner meetings every night. And so you know, six to 11 o'clock might be an important part of your day, but not for others, right? Well, un- unfortunately for you and I, the legislation doesn't apply to us, Ian. Um, uh, that our, our bosses get to make us work 24-7. Um, yeah, that's even true. Our holidays. But, but you know, I think what um, you're, you're exactly right. And, and Nina, maybe for some context around that is oftentimes, you know, I'll be... Th- doing nothing necessarily on a Saturday afternoon and something will come to mind and I'll say, gee, I want to make sure that that lands on the lap of so-and-so. And And so I send them an email right away so that they've got, I don't expect them to deal with it right away, but, but at least I know I've passed that message on and it's in, in, in my mind, it it started down the path of, of, uh, of, of being dealt with, but I think all, you know, that's easy to do. I don't think that stuff's ever going to stop. And it's easy just to put a little tag on every email and just say, hey, I don't expect you to deal with it now. But, you know, on Monday, that'd be fine. But here's where the, here's where the big problem is, Nina, and you, you, you touched on it a little bit. So you've got, 
you know, a, a culture now of two years of working remotely for a lot of individuals who were not used to it. Admittedly, the first three months of them working remotely, they couldn't stand it. They wanted to come back into the office because they were going bonkers at home. All of a sudden, uh, they got used to it and said, hey, this is kind of convenient because you know what, when the I don't have to worry about the dog, I can take the dog out for a walk in the afternoon. I think where the problem might be um, is you're going to open up the, the sincere discussion from an employer's perspective on time theft. And if we're going to be expected as employers to create a policy that, that dictates when we, when we disconnect our employees and connect our employees, we also need to be able to have an ability to be able to monitor time theft and say, well, if my employees are all working from home and I sent them an email at five after five and they're going to get mad because I'm not adhering to the disconnect policy. How do I know as an employer that they haven't taken the dog out for a one hour walk in the park this, this afternoon on my time? So you raise actually a really huge issue, which is managers are going to need to get trained to have those discussions. I have employees with young children and they need to start late because school, the bus doesn't pick them up till 930. Um, and they've essentially told me like, you know, we and we can do this because I'm in a law firm. It's yep. not a manufacturing. It can be done that they need a, like an extra long lunch break because the kids come back home and then they'll finish off a few things after 630. And we, that works, you know, we've had, we've essentially negotiated a timetable that works. And I can tell in general from the productivity I'm seeing that that works. One comment I would make about those emails, and I'm guilty of it too, is I really recommend use the delay deliver uh, feature in your email. I do the same thing you do. I have a thought bubble and I send a quick <laughs> email off. Yeah. But what happens to my associates when they see that is they think, oh, well, Nina's working Sunday afternoon, which means that I have to work Sunday afternoon. It sends the wrong yeah. message. If, in fact, I don't need work to be done on the weekend, I, I delay the delivery to like 8.30 or 9 o'clock on a Monday morning. So that even, you know, the, the addicted associate who checks to see if anybody loves them sees that no partner needs them on a Sunday <laughs> and they can go skiing or they can go, you know, uh, like, you know, to the library and they really have a psychological break because it's not having that psychological break. Or if you have to send something, you actually phone them and say, hey, look, really sorry, client so-and-so just got served with something, didn't realize it got served with something. I really do need you to look at it and, and, and I'm sending it to you now. And, and that's in a white collar setting. In a lot of other settings, we don't need to, you know, we don't need, we're not responding to emergencies like that. Let's flip it over. Let's talk about a manufacturing plant. You know, you've got certain people that are going to have to be on call and you're going to have to work on an on-call schedule so that it isn't 100% of the people 100% of the time. And it isn't always the, the owner of the company that gets stuck with everything because there's nobody else who's going to take an email to your point at five minutes after five. But it's those discussions that management will have to have to see what kind of duty to disconnect and what are the exceptions, but it shouldn't be the rule. I think what's happened in the last two years, the rule is we're not disconnected as opposed to, I think the rule should be, we have downtime and we are courteous about impinging on downtime, just like we would be courteous about knocking on someone's door and walking into their house. So I think that's kind of the psychological shift we're about to embark upon. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I think as someone who lives in the sure and certain hope that one day Greg will send me a nice email and say, tell me what a great job I'm doing. I'm constantly looking at my email on the weekend to, to see if Greg will send me something nice. That's a little joke because, he, you know, we, we go back and forth. But um, maybe I'm going to there's a couple of questions here and I don't know if they if they go together. I mean, we there's there are those that think this is this is good legislation specifically on this right to disconnect for all the reasons that you describe and i think for those of us i know greg you work on work, work workplace culture just like i do because my staff even though i've only got 18 so i'm under the threshold everyone's under everyone's under pressure everyone even working at home they kind of like working at home but when i ask them 
kind of survey questions, they all kind of feel a sense as though that there's more and more to do, even though they're working at home. So there is some merit to this. But there are companies where this is going to be very difficult. Greg's highlighted, you've done it. You got companies that are 24-7, 365, which you've talked about. You got many companies are global companies. So working, if you've got clients in Asia or Africa or Europe, um, by definition, you're not going to be in our on our schedule. It's, that's just obvious. Um, so you got different time zones, um, employers in different or employees in different places, 24-7. Um where are your clients being serviced from? So there are on both sides, I can see, why don't you kind of lay out the, the case for and the case against, and then ultimately, I think you've already hit on it. It's going to happen because employees will demand that there be some respect for their time. Employers will expect that they can manage their employees' time and workflow. Where does this land in between? So maybe give both cases and then, and then kind yeah. of where you think it's going to land. So I've actually heard, you know, concerns about this uh, right to disconnect if it's indiscriminate, indiscriminately applied and for from people who really need the flex time. You know, so parents being number one in this pandemic, um, multinational corporations and 24-7 operations. And I think the the intelligence that we need is not everything is an emergency and let us be more judicious in when we schedule things or expect people to respond off hours. The other thing is that, you know, we've got to be realistic of what you can expect people to do in an eight hour day. You know, it is to a certain extent, the word no is necessary. Sure, Ian, I am sure you would like to do 20 more, you know, webinars, but is it realistic for you to expect your team to organize 20 more webinars? Because we know that each webinar takes at least X number of hours. And I think sometimes, and I'm like this, I'm like, you know, think, oh, wouldn't that be a great idea? But if you're going to have more ideas and more work, there should also be a pruning out of other things. You can't keep expecting people to do more and more with the same allotment of hours because it's impossible. And then what happens is people just overwork and then they leave. I mean, um, it's not a secret that associates have left a number of large law firms. The great resignation has impacted my industry as well as a number of the people on this call. And it's because they were just, okay, well, you know, we've got more work, we'll just throw more at the associates. And the associates saying, look, you know what? No, we're not doing this anymore. And so uh, it's sort of like, yes, we need to be conscious of some of the difficulties. And that's why the law did not create a standard policy. It said, you, the business, are going to figure out how to do this for your company. Understanding all of that. But the bottom line is we need to be respectful that, you know, people are being paid for, let's say, an eight or, you know, if you're a manager, realistically, probably a 10 or 11 hour day. And that's it, you know, and not to try to get people to work 24-7, 365, because we have the digital leash that enables us to do so. And do you think, do you think, Nina, that that was the purpose for the government to kind of just you know, throw this out there and say, this is what you got to do. But with very few details, if any, less than a paragraph of, you know, information behind it. And, and so they're just saying, you know, you'll figure it out. But what you have to do is you have to plan for people to have their own time. And, and you can't, you know, it, it's so funny because I was listening to an advocate uh, of this um, uh, a bill um, or this particular part of the Working for Workers Act. And, um, and she said on there, you know, you have to have time where, where workers can leave the workplace and they can take their phone and throw it in a drawer and leave it there until they have to go to work again. Well, I was at Best Buy yesterday because I had to get a little thingy for one of my staff to <laughs> plug into their computer. That's the technical <laughs> term. You know, yeah, that thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, that's that's the that's the Ian McLean term for it. because That's true. That is absolutely true. So I walk into the store and every single associate on the floor, salesperson or, or whatever you want to call it, was like this with their head buried in their device, scrolling through things. Not one of them were up looking for the next customer that they could sell something to. And I, it, it struck me at that point because I had just heard this advocate um, uh, talk about it. And I thought, you know what? The 
that advocate doesn't understand that there is not one human being that has one of these that puts it in the drawer after their workday. Not one. <laughs> yeah. They carry it around. You, all you have to do is find a millennial and take away their phone. And in 10 minutes, they'll have knives out and, and, and shears ready to, to cut your throat. They got to have their phone. So, um, you know, I think that's unrealistic for people to, to expect people to put their phone down and not respond. But uh, that's because- why that's why, Greg, having that delay of email to the next working hour is such a, t- you know, I know you're going to check. That's why, and my associates are all millennials or Gen Zers, and they're high performers, and they yeah. don't want to miss out. But if you get into the habit as a gray whole, gray person to essentially saying, "No, I have a brilliant idea," but the brilliant idea's response can wait till Monday or Tuesday, it really helps. But I think that's more of a metaphor. Okay, what I mean by that is, you know, Best Buy's hours are probably nine to nine, you know, in general. So we're not. But the metaphor is. Can we limit business-related communications? Can we start using subject lines saying non-urgent, does not require response for information only, so people know that there isn't a scary pile for them when they get to work, right, and have that sick feeling? And can we be more respectful of people's time, particularly those who are not taught, you know, getting paid a lot of money, who are not professionals, who are not owners, who are not executives? I don't think it's fair, quite frankly, to accept, expect you know, somebody who's getting paid $20 an hour to be held to the same availability as my senior executives. Like, I just think that there is conceptually a different expectation. Mm-hmm. There's also some cons. And Ian, you, you asked me a comment fairly. There is some fear about this. And some of the fear comes from a place I wasn't expecting, which was gender. A lot of women are saying, well, you know, you can have these policies, but if they're not really culturally ingrained, what's going to happen is there's going to be two classes of citizens. You know, the, the citizens who essentially exercise their right to disconnect and the citizens who don't. And they're worried that they will lose a competitive advantage, presumably to people who don't have parenting duties or men who have a more traditional marriage where the women take on the parenting duties, and that that will essentially create more gender imbalance in the workforce. Now, I have more confidence in my Gen Z uh, or Gen Z and and millennial workforce. I see them to be be much more egalitarian than perhaps our generation in their family life and their expectations. But it is is a concern that we cannot forget that gender uh, fear, if you will. Yeah, you know, yeah. I think that's that's interesting, and I, I mean, I, I certainly take that as a single dad raising two kids and doing all of, and elderly parents. I can certainly identify with with you know trying to make all the or balance all those things, and and you know p- part of what you described is that there. I think you said earlier there are other um, jurisdictions. I think you said Europe, but what are some of those best practices? Because because I think what you're describing is certainly some of the best practices using delay. Um, you know, for information, not not to be actioned, et cetera. Are those some of the best practices? And, and maybe talk a little bit about what some other jurisdictions have done, because I think Greg's point of where there's a lot of fear for business uh, uh, that are watching this and that have been asking us questions is with so little definition about what's expected. And I think I'm going to save the last question around what what could the penalties be? But let's talk about where this actually is in place, what people have done to try and put some boundaries around that, that work for both the business and the employee and make sure that there's not this, this inequity that's created, whether it's gender, whether it's, you know, single parents versus uh, two parent families, that's yeah. another one. Um, th- th- those are, those are very real concerns. So um, the companies that have done this the best have approached it with a change management philosophy. And they've actually started with, why is it that we have communications after hours? And how much of that is really important and necessary? And how much of that could be delayed to the next working shift? And they came up with some really interesting answers. Some are like Greg and Nina, 
they like to send, they have a brilliant idea. They want to send off the email right away and they don't use the, you know, they, they're not expecting a response. They just want to get it out. Uh, some people like the flexibility. So that was, you know, one of the reasons. And sometimes it was just, there was too much work to do. So people were in fact, not working eight hour days. They were working 10, 11, 12 hour days. And some of it was stupid stuff, you know, like, you know, how we get on to like everybody, you know, reply all to everybody and all, oh yes, I know. I hate that. I hate that. I truly <laughs> hate that. Um, so they actually did an inventory and then they figured out, okay, what do we, what communications are necessary? Obviously, if there's that plumbing leak I talked about earlier, we're going to have to deal with it before, you know, you know, the next business day, you know, um, there may well be a, a deadline like for submission and we and all of a sudden, you know, I've had the computer ate my homework, so I have to reconstruct the draft, you know, whatever, but those are emergencies what can we do to reduce those emergencies? Some of the best things to reduce overwork is good project planning, something I'm not always good at, full disclosure, but that is it. And the other thing is learning to say no. Even if you have ideas for 20 more webinars and 20 more conferences, maybe you don't have to do it. Select what you're doing and do it. So that was sort of like that, that whole discussion with your management team. Why are we doing this? And they really created a plan to say, okay, these types of communications and interactions are needed. And it's just simply needed. Like we are never going to be eliminated. We're a 24-7, 365 plan. There's always going to have to be someone on call. This is what's considered an emergency, really doing that kind of training. And then best practices for reducing, you know, kind of that overload. And so then what they essentially have is an education about what happens when you feel, I mean, we're not going to a complaint system, but what happens when you feel like you have to work after hours? In other words, you can't get stuff done in seven and a half or eight hours to have open conversations with your manager and that the manager has to be open. So in other words, if I say, look, I'm really struggling to get this done, it isn't you're a bad employee and you're going to get fired. It's a, okay, what's interfering and how can we do a better job? And what you see is a culture shift that starts occurring because people start, hmm, do I need to send this email now? Do I need to copy nine people? You know, like you start seeing like a culture shift happening. There's good precedence, as I said, copy some of the European ones for ideas. Big companies will bring in IT to see if there's some IT hacks that can be used. But definitely the number one tip trip tip that was given to me is project planning reduces emergencies yeah mm -hmm. okay um, so so maybe here's here's one of the, there's a question that came in and i think this is greg you highlighted this when you and i talked and said look you know we should have gowlings do and i think they did a session with you this morning for the cambridge chamber and us and said look let's let's do this together because this is a common theme for not only our members but business as a, as a whole one of the concerns that, and I guess it's more fear of the unknown when there's not enough detail to know what's actually expected of them. So Nina, you're doing a great job of filling in, but it sure didn't come from the government because no. it's a, a paragraph uh, of legislation that says, here it is, um, fills no one with confidence that they're doing the right thing. So there is, um, there's concern, Greg, or fear, if you will, around what do I do and what if I don't get it right? The question that came in, and this is, I can imagine there's going to be a boatload of questions like this. Um, they say, if we're, at, if we're on a 35-hour work week, should we think about implementing a 40-hour week, work week because of the legislation to allow for, you know, and, and then, then you're getting into extra cost. Now, it may work out in the long run, but ultimately, these are the concerns of business owners saying, do I pay more to pay people longer so that they can get those things done? Can you ever really manage? Because once you get to 40 hours, well, that won't be enough because you'll need 42 hours, right? So Nina's project managed to, to make sure you can fit it in is probably good. But Greg, talk a little bit about that fear, because that's what I hear from people going, going how do I get it right? Well, I, I have I have uh, smaller employers, you know, 25, 30 employees saying, you know what? I, I pay a lot of my staff on salary. I think I'm going to go to hourly and I'm going to go to hourly because if I have to, I pay them salary because there are expectations of finishing or completing a task. And if they can do it in, in, in their eight hour day, uh, that's great. 
but they also recognize they have to complete the task. So if it takes eight and a half hours, you know, that's, that's not my deal. I've planned for them to work an eight hour day. Um, if they've extended it because they took a little bit longer at lunch, whatever the case may be. So maybe I'm going to move to hourly rates. And if they want to be off the clock uh, and disconnected at five o'clock, then that's when I stop paying them. And, uh, and I think it, you know, this whole conversation and Nina, I think, I suspect this is not going to be a discussion around the boardroom tables of the Fortune 500 companies. This is going to be around the offices of 30 and 50 and 75 person organizations that are saying, uh, you know, how do I cope with this? Like this, you know, my employees are important to the business and there are times I'm going to need, I'm going to want to reach out, not need, but want to reach out to give them advance warning on something. So a um, couple of things that I might suggest is um, the legislation doesn't actually say you can't send emails or communicate, you know, after the seven and a half hour day. Uh, even Volkswagen, which who's known in Europe as a big leader, actually had a wider um, period of time in which communications could be sent because they know some people start at seven, some people start at nine. And so naturally their end time is a bit. So essentially what they're saying is let's carve out a period where we're going to really down pencils, right? So it may be for your guy, it's like the period of time that's going to be considered to be an appropriate working message is nine to five or nine to five 30. That's your 40 hour week. Even though the expectation is you're going to work seven and a half hours a day and some work with your manager that, you know what, you might need a two hour lunch because you've got so much going on at lunchtime with the kids. Um, and you might need to make up that time later on. So really that's the art of it, right? Remember, we're trying to talk about culture change. And you and I are old enough to remember, you know, the culture change around harassment in the workplace. And it started with, you know, we want to create a policy and, and the government didn't give them a lot of direction. Then they realized we needed direction. So they then gave more direction. But really, it's the education and it's the culture change that has made it better for the next generation of, frankly, women um, in the workplace. So that's what we're trying to achieve now. It's a culture change process. Right now, it's a little baby step. Think about the issue and write a policy. And you've got till June 1 to do it. If you're really stuck, retain our firm. We'll help you with it. <laughs> but I'm sure I had to put the plug in. So Bryce Kreiker, my managing partner, doesn't fire me. Um, but, uh, you know, there are good HR consultants that can help you. We can help you. There, there's stuff that can be done. But the harder thing is that culture change. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that's an important part, a point. I'm not sure I, I immediately went since there's a little bit of I've been in government, I've worked for government. Uh, there's a little bit of suspicion when they put this in here of what it actually means for people. So maybe let's finish off this because I want to save the last uh, 10 minutes or so because there's some other chunks in here that we talked about at the beginning. I want to I want to get to with you and Greg. But Greg, the the I think the fear part also is and I've heard this before is What's this going to cost me if I don't get it right, right? So, and I'm not sure, and I'm, I think I hear you saying, I'm not sure that I've seen what the penalties is because I don't think it actually exists. But Greg, that's one of those fear parts that we hear from business, especially for, and, and I think it, it's important to understand most of our businesses, 70 or 50, 60% would be under the threshold, mm -hmm. but they'll be under tremendous pressure to be putting this same policy for all the reasons that Nina talked about, the cultural change is what, and it should be. I mean, I think everyone should try their best to, to, uh, to, to manage and respect people's times, but small businesses will still be fearful. They're saying if they did it to those guys, they might do it to us. Yeah. And how do I manage through that? So there's a fear piece, Greg, that, that yeah. of, of non-compliance. Isn't that always the fear though, right? So yeah. if, if the penalty is a slap on the wrist, there's a little less fear. Um, but uh, but now uh, I suspect, and I don't know because I haven't read anything about that penalty. I don't know that the government's decided whether what the penalty is going to be necessarily. I can maybe help you a little bit with that. So, um, you know, the typical way this is going to there's two ways that this becomes an issue. One is an employee complains. Uh, and the other uh, is the Ministry of Labor sends one of their random auditors to look and says, you know, you need this policy, you need this policy, you haven't done this. 
in 99% of cases, you're going to get an order to comply. So there's not a financial penalty. You'll be told, send us, you know, you should have done a policy, you know, a year ago, you know, you've got 30 days to get it done. And the reason I know this is I'm always retained when, you know, you get one of those order to complies. And so <laughs> we have to, we get that done for you. Um, and that's what happened with the, when they put in the harassment legislation decades ago, you know, you know, and somebody didn't have a policy, they were given an, an order to comply. Um, and secondly, I just want to give a shout out, you know, I suspect that WSPS, which is Workplace Safety and Prevention Services, it's partially subsidized by your WSIB premiums, will no doubt have some good materials and learnings around it, because they historically have tried to create some good templates for people who are WSIB employers. If they get really annoyed at you, you're going to start seeing fines. But the fines in the beginning tend to be 150, you know, then they go up to 500, then they go to 1500. They could be ridiculous. They can go up to 10, 20, 30,000 for a business. But I have to tell you, after 30 years of practice, I have never seen those levels of fines because the government wants you to comply. They, it, this is not a piece of legislation where they're trying to, you know, it's not a revenue maker for anybody. Uh, it is really trying to create a culture change and you're not going to create culture change by getting a whole bunch of businesses angry at you. So, uh, so I am reasonably hopeful that there will not be huge monetary penalties in the beginning. Now, if you keep ignoring orders to comply, there's a limit to what I can do for you. Yeah. But, you know, and I think really it's like, please comply. You've got six months. Please comply. You've got, well, you should have had it, you know, June 1. We'll give you another 30 days. Um, and I'm drawing an analogy to the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act and the sexual harassment stuff where it was not a penalty heavy piece of legislation. Yeah, we're we're gonna we're gonna work on a on 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 a policy, even though we're not at twenty five employees. Only because I think you know from a from a competitive perspective, it's kind of like you know how much do you pay your employees? How much holiday time do you start them with? How much you know? All of those little things are retention policies, right? So you know, I think I think that's what the pressure down on smaller businesses are going to be. You know, you're going to have to have this because everybody's going to have it, and 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 you may lose an employee because they know, hey, this one's got a, a right to disconnect policy, and you know, Derosher's sending me emails at all hours of the day and night, <laughs> and you know, I'm out of here. So, well, uh, God knows, no one wants that, Greg. No, no one wants that. <laughs> Listen, um, a good place to end that. Let's let's move on. But I mean, one of the one of the other questions that did come in, I think we've touched on this, is. Is there a difference between management and non-management? The answer is, you know, I, I think we, we've heard is it's it it's, it's affects everybody, although there are differences uh, of, of expectations. And part of that's a salary, uh, is, you know, salary versus uh, uh, hourly, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, listen, um, I want to move on. And and I don't know if there was anything else uh, uh, with the gig workers thing, Nina, that you wanted to highlight. I, no, I just, I... Uh, no. I mean, listen, there is no doubt that we're going to have to see a total reworking of our Employment Standards Act um, to deal with the gig and occasional workers. Uh, I I worry about my my kid and I worry about the next generation because you know, the gig economy has a certain bohemian charm to it, but bohemian charm doesn't get you health care. It doesn't get you good housing. It doesn't get you uh, a pension plan or, or an ability to retire when you're grumpy and old. And I'm getting grumpier and older as I speak with you. And so I, I worry about, you know, that, and we're going to have to, as a society, deal with that. And this is, uh, but th the bathroom issue is just such a human issue. You're asking yeah. people to sell yeah. your stuff and deliver your stuff and you're not letting them use your bathroom. Like, I may not be happy about it, but on a human level, of course, I'm going to let somebody use my washroom. Yeah. Like, I mean, so that was all that this legislation does. The non-compete one, Ian, might be worth yeah. spending a couple of minutes. I know sure. we're always short on time because we're all talkers. And so... Yeah. <laughs> We got ten minutes. We got to get through three more issues. So let's let's go on this one, the non competes. 
Well, it's a very, again, it's a very simple piece of legislation. It says that in an employment agreement with an employee, except with a executive, a non-compete is not going to be enforceable. Now, lawyers like myself will say, well, that was kind of a law anyway. Judges never enforce non-competes for against ordinary employees. What's a, a, what I'm struggling with, Ian, is in the lead up to this legislation, they made it sound like if it was a non-solicit. In other words, I hire you to do sales for Gowlings. Um, I'm going to give you my client list. Uh, you're going to go and try to drum up business for me. And then you leave me and go to a boutique law firm with my list. Okay. Now it may not be a, an actual list, but it's the list in your head that I really care about the, the relationships. And it, there was some discussion about, you know, they would have uh, permitted an employer to say, you can't solicit the customers you serviced on my behalf and develop relationships with on my behalf. Now I'm telling you that the legislation is so broadly and vaguely drafted, it's not clear to me whether or not I can protect a perfectly reasonable non-solicit, a non-solicit that a judge would have previously thought, you know what, that's been crafted with care. It's an enforceable obligation. It's not fair for someone to leave an employer with all those relationships and immediately turn around and, and use the relationships that they only got because they were being paid by the employer to develop them. That's my problem with this legislation. So some maybe offline, I think that the chambers of commerce should really pressure this government to clarify that it is appropriate and fair to expect uh, employees not to poach uh, so, customers. So just one clarification, because a question came in in the chat box. Is there a difference between a non-compete agreement and a non-solicit yeah. agreement? Sure, there is. A, okay. non, a non-compete. Let's say I was an employee. A non-compete agreement would be, Nina, you agree that if Gallings terminates you, you will not exercise a profession of a lawyer um, right. anywhere in the Kitchener, Waterloo, you know, Wellington area. So that could be the non-compete. That really prohibits me from exercising my profession in any way and is really unfair because there's, you know, society wants me to work and pay taxes yeah. as opposed to be unemployed. Um, a non-solicit is more like we're going to introduce you to our customers and you agree that for a period of time, maybe that's six months or a year, you're not going to poach those customers. You're not going to try to get them. That's what's called a non-solicit. Okay. Historically, that's been, you know, because that means I could be a lawyer, you know, working in another law firm, working on their clients, but I'm not trying to poach clients. And I think people understand that. So that just distinction isn't clear in the legislation so i'm hoping it will get clarified soon well that's something that we uh, maybe the three of us offline because i do think that yeah. is that is something that, that that this is i think the legislation as a whole probably leans more um, mm. it for for the the individual so the populist mm. part but there needs to be a corresponding um effectiveness or or purpose for a particular small business because that that's competitive advantage listen two more topics we've got seven minutes to do it greg um international trained professionals and i think you know just a brief um the the scenario that you've been dealing with with a with a family physician as one example of the idiocy that that exists with not allowing and, and and some of this is the regulatory agencies like the medical association or the law and frankly the law society or other places where you've come you've got your training but then you're prevented from from extra you know using your your credentials maybe talk a little bit just about that example uh, and then why this is an important thing for for business to be to be cleaned up because we're so talent short we can't afford to have people sitting on the sideline. Well, it's largely, as I always say, Ian, it's legislation written by uh, bureaucrats working in offices with no windows. They <laughs> don't see the real world and they don't live in the real world, apparently. Um, so they don't understand what's going on. But let me give them, if any of them are ever going to hear my voice, a little bit of words of wisdom. If I'm standing in the lineup going into the movie theater and I have a heart attack, and there's a cardiologist standing visiting from India 
I'm going to be very thankful that the cardiologist behind me from India is probably going to save my life while I'm standing in line at the movie theater. The government needs to understand that too. And while we understand things, specialty professions like lawyers and engineers and architects maybe need to be brought up to date as to the intricacies and differences they are still lawyers, engineers, and architects, and they're still cardiologists. And I quite frankly think if that cardiologist in India opens somebody up and spreads open their rib cage, they're going to see the same thing in there as they're going to see over here. <laughs> so, you know, I, like I have no sympathy for the OMA uh, regulating the, 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 uh, the, the um, licensing of doctors uh, because in essence, what they're doing, and I and I understand we have a we have a capped system of expenditures. I, I get some of that, but it just it it really does not celebrate the universal healthcare system that we have in Canada, where we're trying to provide as much as we possibly can to every single person here. We can't be regulating, we can't be rationing healthcare. We need to be developing healthcare and bringing in those other expertise from around the world and, and finding a way where we can uh, uh, approve them immediately. And it doesn't, you know, it, yes, there's, there's all kinds of little training that has to happen, but my goodness, I had a, a friend of ours who was a nurse in the Philippines who came here legally, couldn't practice as a nurse because you know, they wouldn't license her. She literally went to nursing college again to become a nurse. And two years ago, she finally graduated for a second time. So I always tell her she's a super nurse now because, you know, she can do anything. But, you know, those kinds of things need, they need to be sped up because we can't develop our society and our economy without that happening. You know, I, uh, uh, my comment on that is a lot of this is in the regulated professions. And essentially, uh, what uh, the government has said is that you can't require Canadian experience as part of as your regulation unless you can demonstrate there's a health and safety. I would have liked to have seen um, essentially time uh, commitments on how fast they're going to review. You know, like these are self-regulated colleges. So they're like essentially these independent monarchies. So the Law Society of Ontario regulates me independently of the government of Ontario. But it would be nice to see some, okay, you're going to review my application and you're going to process it with the expectations you'll process it, good, bad, or indifferent, and tell me what I need to do. And that has to be demonstrably linked to public safety and competence. Um, you know, uh, you we're putting pressure on you to create a, um, um, you know, a system where the presumption is that people's uh, credentials ought to be uh, recognized and ways of making sure we're putting the pressure on you to figure out ways of making sure that's true, because it is true. Engineers are trained differently across the world. Doctors are trained differently across the world. Nurses are trained across. So it's like, if I want somebody to know how to do things here, what is it that I can do to speed it up? Don't you find it an ironic, Greg, that by fiat, they essentially allowed all those internationally trained nurses to be presumptively allowed to work under supervision. It took a pandemic and 30, you know, 32,000 deaths to get them to do that. I mean, why isn't it we couldn't do that for all professions and, and, and essentially say, you know, maybe it's not a paid apprenticeship. Maybe say, you know, like, you know, you'll do it. You'll, you'll, you know, like the first, you know, few weeks, you know, it's not going to get paid and then the company can decide whether to pay you or not. Uh, can I put a plug in for our firm? You know, like many Bay Street firms, our firm was reluctant to take internationally trained professionals. I was one of the people who said, look, I'm from an immigrant community. I know how good people really are. I got the first internationally trained person here who's now a full partner. Yay. Um, and she's amazing. But what it did is, oh, she really is amazing. And so now we start looking at internationally trained lawyers and we've got a number of them and they're fabulous. And you can't tell the difference in their work permit. Yeah, they did a few things differently, but I have to train all my, 
associates. So like, yeah. you know, no, you know what, what else is interesting about that is this particular nurse, that example that I use, her immigration status and her ability to come here as a landed immigrant was based on the fact that she was a nurse. That's where she got all of her points. She got all of but her points for, for yeah, immigrating. to, And then she gets here and they say, well, yeah, it's really nice that you're a nurse, but you can't practice unless you go yeah. back to school. You know, like completely. Come, listen, we're out of time. Listen, I, I'm and I'm going to uh, impose on both of you because I think the WSIB not only is part of this legislation, but I think WSIB uh, is is a big is an emerging issue for 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 many businesses. So maybe we'll come back and do that as a as a separate session uh, in the coming weeks and uh, or next couple of months. You're, but, you're always an imposition, so that's fine, <laughs> no problem. I know, but I like to do it. It, it, it I just like to keep you on edge, Greg. So listen, um, I, I think we'll leave it there for today. I, I want to say I, I think Nina, your comment is is good. Is that it took a pandemic for some of these these uh, issues to come to light. Uh, and particularly as it relates to uh, for, foreign born uh, and trained professionals, which is, is going to be so incredibly important because talent is the number one, number two, and number three thing that regardless of which angle we look at it, that's the biggest issue for business today. Listen, thank you, Nina um, uh, Gupta from, uh, from Gallings for joining us today. That does, and, for, and to Gregory for taking time out of his schedule to put up with my abuse uh, thank you uh, for joining us for today's session. Really appreciate your, your time and expertise. And to our title sponsor for the series, Manulife, and our platinum sponsor of the series, the Immigration Partnership of Waterloo Region. And finally, to all of you for joining us today. As a reminder, we do host a new business success series session every Wednesday. Please join us next week for Triple Bottom Line, People, Planet and Profit, Environmental, Social and Governance Considerations, are the three foundational areas of corporate sustainability. Join Dr. Stephanie Sobek Swan, Executive Director of the Rare Charitable uh, Research Reserve, and Rob Connell, he's the Shred Partner at KPMG, to learn how ESG metrics and compliance are not just big for big business, but how small business can benefit from environmentalism and social impact planning. We hope to see you then. For for more details and and to register, please register at greaterkwchamber.com. Please do share this series with your friends and colleagues and join us every Wednesday afternoon for another Business Success Series because if it's Wednesday, it's the Business Success Series. Thanks so much. I appreciate everyone joining us. Have a good day. Thanks, gang. That was great.